Hey there. I offer this podcast freely. Your support really makes a difference. To make a donation, visit ReneeMcKenna.com. Welcome to Spiritual Psychology. My name is Renee Lavalley McKenna, and I bring my 30 plus years as a recovering addict and ex crazy person turned therapist and shamanic healer to bring you snackable teachings on spirituality, psychology, and all things personal growth. And today I want to talk about sexual, social, and emotional anorexia. And most people are familiar with anorexia around food called anorexia nervosa where people refuse to eat or are obsessed with losing weight. People that are anorexic might use laxatives, exercise, extreme calorie restriction, or making themselves throw up, which is called bulimia, as a way to stay thin or avoid gaining weight. And anorexia is an emotional and mental disorder that can actually be life-threatening. It's estimated that anywhere from 1% to 4% of women might suffer from anorexia nervosa in their lifetime, but only about 1 in 10 of those will ever receive treatment. And there's a list of models, musicians, and gymnasts who have died by starving themselves through anorexia. And the definition of an anorexic is someone who has a loss of appetite or a fear of consuming food. And for the sexual, social, or emotional anorexic... There's a loss of appetite for intimacy and connection with others, combined with a fear of that contact. And although you might not starve to death physically, being starved of love, intimacy, and sexuality is a different way to become emaciated. We are sexual, social, and emotional beings, and caring for our feelings, for our relationality, and our need for community and meaningful connection with others is incredibly important for our health and wholeness as humans. And COVID absolutely ravaged people's dating lives, their family interactions, and almost all in-person social engagements that people had. And this ambiguity that exists with COVID right now, where a lot of people are still getting it, but very few people are dying, most people aren't even getting very seriously ill, has left many in this place of continued confusion and fear. And many people have been isolated now for years, both older people and younger people. Many children and teens have come to have their relationships online. Their social and emotional skills have gotten stunted because they missed a couple years of development and interaction. And many older people are plagued with fear to go out that they might get sick and die. It's too risky to interact with others. So I think awareness of sexual, emotional, and social anorexia is particularly important at this moment right now. I've worked with a few client couples who had sexless marriages. In one of the couples, the woman was the sexual anorexic, and the other, the husband, was the sexual avoidant. And both of these were long-term marriages with kids. And one of the couples decided to stay together because the larger algorithm of their life with family and extended family and the children and the property they owned and the deep connections that they had in other ways actually worked for them. And the last I met with them, they were working on scheduling having sex a couple times a month, but their communication was greatly improved. And so the emotional connection seemed to be enough for the husband at that point. The other couple decided to divorce because the husband's anorexia was just too intense for the wife, and they're both in new dating relationships. So sexual, social, and emotional anorexia are often ways that people attempt to keep themselves defended or safe from harm. The idea that if we don't interact, that nothing bad can happen to us and we're protected. And often that's a response to unresolved trauma or childhood abuse. Both of the sexual anorexics in the couples that I worked with had unresolved childhood trauma. One of them had a mentally ill parent, and the other one was sexually abused as a child. And although sexual or social anorexia may keep people safe on some level, it also keeps them stunted and frozen in their life. So a lot of times we have to deal with the underlying emotional issues first and develop healthy, more mature adult protective behaviors that allow the person to feel safe while taking risks and developing healthy intimacy. And it must be noted that sexual withdrawal can also be a reactive behavior or device that people use to punish their partners or as a way to act out 
conflict and be passive aggressive within a relationship. I know in my very first long-term relationship, and it's probably the only time I ever did this, there were many extended periods of time where I denied him sex. Now, I happened to be in a major depression during that time, eating compulsively. I was super overweight and hated my body. But to be quite honest, I also rather hated him. I had all these unresolved resentments and so much anger, and I was completely incapable of being honest because I was radically separated from my own feelings, my own emotional anorexia. And I remember he would try to initiate sex with me, and I would literally tell him I had a headache or didn't feel good to get out of it because I just had no desire to have any kind of intimacy with him. And I didn't know how to end the relationship. A very dark and sad time in my life. And although I have generally identified as a sex addict and had a lot of one night stands and compulsive affairs with married or otherwise inappropriate men, men who were usually emotionally unavailable, but mirrored my own emotional unavailability. And it became clear to me later that sexuality was standing in for intimacy for me because my own fear of intimacy was so great. And for quite a few years, sex was the only intimate contact that I had with people because as my alcoholism and drug addiction progressed, my ability to have friendships and to connect in a healthy way with family and partners were skills that just fell away. In fact, ones that I had never really developed. It cost me a lot of money in therapy. <laughs> and a lot of personal growth work to become emotionally available. So in my own recovery from emotional anorexia and replacing sex addiction with healthy sexual intimacy, I can really speak from experience that deeply connecting with our own authenticity and the healthy expression of our feelings, our spirit, connecting both the genitals and the heart in sexuality are incredibly nourishing and fulfilling experiences that I'm so grateful that I have grown to be able to participate in in my life. Whenever we have any extreme of behavior, either acting out too much or withdrawing completely, there's usually something deeper going on that will remain a catalyst for that dysfunction until we put it on the table, work with it, and develop new, more healthy, constructive, productive ways of being. And I'm helping to facilitate this new woman's 12-step meeting where we work the steps together as a group. And we were looking at the first step, which is where we get honest or admit what we're powerless over or what's making our life unmanageable today. And four of the women in that group talked about being terrified of intimacy. One had never had an adult relationship with a man. She said, I know how painful it was to have crushes when I was in high school that were never returned. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to actually have a grown-up relationship. So she's never had one. And she's in her 30s. Another said she hadn't dated since 2002. One of them's recovering from a divorce and has developed an inner narrative that she's too fat, too old too ugly, no one would ever want her again. Deeply frightened to open herself emotionally. And the fourth is in yet another sexless marriage. And we live in a culture that's simultaneously obsessed with sex and terrified of intimacy at the same time. Before I forget, I have a podcast on the 12 steps for everyone. If you're interested in learning more about the 12 steps, how they might benefit you in your life, podcast number 61, 12 steps for everyone. And so certainly if someone has an eating disorder and they're starving themselves, it can be easy to see that there's something wrong. I saw a woman at the gym the other day with her elbows and knees protruding. She looked like a walking skeleton. It's very disturbing. But sexual and emotional anorexia is not so easy to spot. People might be very successful in other areas of their life, and most people don't share deeply about their sex life. And for many couples, it becomes the norm to avoid the difficult conversations. Again, we don't live in a culture that has healthy, mature sexual conversations. And I have a podcast about that too. <laughs> Maybe not coincidentally, podcast number 69, let's talk about sex. I had a therapist once who said, talking about sex should be like talking about what we're having for dinner. 
because it's a healthy, normal part of human life. And many of us have a lot of shame and fear around talking about sexuality because we have a fear of intimacy. We may have an idealized self-image of ourself that doesn't fit with these dysfunctional aspects of our life. And we all have dysfunction. And the more we can own all of who we are, the healthier we are. We don't have to be perfect, but the truth will get things moving and set us free. So some of the signs of social, emotional, or sexual anorexia could be that we haven't had sex or been in a close personal relationship for years. We might be in partnerships but find it difficult to be emotionally close. We may have many acquaintances but no one that we're actually intimate with or close to. Maybe we only have close relations with certain kind of people like our children for say but keep distance from everybody else. We might feel overwhelmed in social situations or incapacitated by shyness in relationships with others. We might be emotionally invested in a relationship but remain sexually or socially unavailable. Is there a dread of making phone calls? We might function well in the workplace where intimacy is not valued, but find that we're distanced with family, friends, and lovers. We may have difficulty expressing our emotions and inability to cry or be aware of what my feelings are. And one thing that is fairly common right now is people are actually afraid to leave their house and be in social circumstances. And that may be actually because of COVID, or they may be justifying their social anxiety and using COVID as an excuse. Humans are complicated, and we have many needs that need to be filled and nourished and supported in order to be healthy, happy, and whole. And although we might not die immediately, like we do with lack of food, if we don't have emotional, physical, or sexual contact, We certainly aren't living the fullest life that we could live. And over time, the implications of lack of intimacy, lack of human connection, have profound impact on our mental, emotional, and physical health. Sharing love, intimacy, and connection makes us feel valued and valuable, relieves stress, gives us a sense of purpose. So the good news is no one's perfect. And just looking at where we are being called to grow at any particular time in our life. And there's tremendous help for anorexia. There's so much great therapy out there. And there's some great support groups like Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, a 12-step fellowship that has many resources that focus on anorexia. But if you are sexually, emotionally, or socially anorexic, just reading about it, Gathering information and the safety of your own little bubble will not solve the problem. We need to push into our own discomfort if we want change and healing in our life. And there are more resources available to us on the human plane and the spiritual plane than most of us can imagine. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this podcast, I'd appreciate five stars in Spotify or a good review on iTunes. If you're interested in finding out more about my one-on-one work, shoot me an email, info at reneemckenna.com, and check out the free webinars I'm doing in the upcoming Fridays. There's a link in the show notes. And deep gratitude, as always, to my supporters on Patreon. Blessings on your path until we meet again. This is Renee LaVallee McKenna for Spiritual Psychology.